God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how Paul introduced many of his letters that he wrote to Christians throughout the Roman Empire. And it is my hope that each of you, whether you are present in worship here and now, watching live on live stream or watching at some other time, it is my hope that you will experience the grace and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. On behalf of the whole congregation, I want to welcome any guests who are with us today. As a newcomer to the church, I still don't recognize whether people are guests or regulars. So if you're a guest and want to be recognized as a guest, please introduce yourself to somebody else and you may find out they're a guest also. <laughs> I hope that all of us will feel at home here as we worship Christ together. There are many events and activities that are presented in the Friday Bulletin that was emailed from the church office. If you don't have that access to email or are not on that list, copies are available in the gathering place. I want to draw your attention to two items. First is make sure that you church, check your church mailbox. There's a brochure in there about the capital campaign. We are hoping to raise $350,000 to make necessary repairs and improvements to the church facility. The other announcement concerns a fellowship lunch next Sunday, April 21st, following this worship service. The Climbers Home, Building, Home Builders Group is hosting that lunch. If you would like to participate, make sure you get your reservation and payment to Shirley Stauffer today. And Shirley's in the back of the, the sanctuary now. Let's prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning. What a beautiful day God gave us, huh? A little windy and stuff earlier in the weekend, but all that stuff goes away when we see what he does for us days like today. Please join me in today's responsive call to worship. It's printed on page seven in your bulletin. In the beginning, before time, before people, before all the world began, God was. Here and now among us, beside us, clearer than air, closer than breathing. God is. is. And all that is to come, when we have turned to dust and human knowledge has been completed, God, God will be. be. Not despairing of earth, but delighting in it. Not condemning the world, but redeeming it. Through Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, God, God was, God, God is, is God and God will be. be. Amen.
seated. Let us pray. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. When we look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Creator God, last week when millions of people throughout the United States witnessed the solar eclipse, we were reminded of the mystery and beauty of the universe that you have created. Each day for the rest of our lives, inspire us to worship you with all. Whenever we see the sun, moon, stars, trees, flowers, rivers, oceans, and other wonders of nature, and help us to show our gratitude to you by being faithful stewards of the land and water, animals and people you have entrusted to us. With the awareness of your majesty and power, we come before you as people in need. We are sinful people who have broken your commandments. We have hurt others with our words and actions and our neglect. We need your forgiveness. We are stubborn people who insist on our own way and attack those who do not agree with us. We need your grace to live in humility as Jesus did. We are selfish people who often are indifferent to the plight of others outside our close circle of family and friends. We need you to give us courage and compassion to care for others. We are frail people who are familiar with pain and weakness. We need your healing power. We are weary people at risk of being overwhelmed by sorrow. We need your comfort. We are discouraged people who witness a world filled with seemingly insurmountable problems like poverty, hunger, homelessness, disease, oppression, violence, and war. Use your power to change life for the better, to be what you intended life to be, and work through individuals, churches, charities, businesses, and governments so that we together would respond to these challenges with your mercy and love. We are perplexed people who have important decisions to make. We need your wisdom and guidance. We are mortal people who someday will die we need you to give us hope that because of Jesus, not even death can separate us from you. Guide us with your Holy Spirit so that we may live in faithfulness to you with the confidence of Paul when he wrote, but we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed. We offer these prayers in the name of Jesus. Amen. This morning's invitation to give really touched me, and I'm probably not going to make it through it. I will, with his power. But I want all of you to feel what he's doing through me for use. Sometimes things are unexplainable. 
But as I sat reading the scriptures for today, I paused and just thought about how amazing, great, and giving God is. He created everything we have. What's really amazing, he didn't do it for himself. He did it for all of us. What an amazing, even more powerful and wonderful is that we don't deserve it. We look at the way the world is today. I look at myself, the struggles that we all go through. Along with, you know, what he gave us, he also gave us his son. A lot of folks know me for a lot of years here. I'm blessed to have my son with me today. I couldn't even imagine. Can you guys? There's no better example of giving. How do we repay something like that? What can we do? There's, there's lots of ways. Money, time, talents, whatever it is. There are a few examples. We all need to look and see what God provided us and how, as lonely human beings and sinners on this earth, how do we repay that? Think about it. Let's all do what we can. Get up every morning, thank God for that day, and do the best we can for him, because he sure does it for us. Amen.
This morning's scripture lesson comes from the book of Genesis 1, 1 to 2, 3. And under your pew aisles is a Bible if you'd like to read along with me. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a, a dome in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. So God made the dome and separated the waters that there were under the dome from the waters that were above from the dome. And it was so. God called the dome sky and there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the waters under the sky be gathered together in one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the waters that were gathered together he called seas and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the earth put forth vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees of every kind on earth that bear fruit with the seed in it. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation plants yielding seed of every kind and trees of every kind bearing fruit with seed in it. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. And God said, let there be lights in the dome of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And let them be lights in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night and the stars. God set them in the dome of the sky to give light upon the earth, to rule over the day and over the night, and to separate the light from the darkness. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the fourth day. And God said, let the waters bring forth swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the dome of the sky. So God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves of every kind with which the waters swarm and every winged bird of every kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill the waters in the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. And there was evening and there was morning the fifth day. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures of every kind, cattle and creeping things and wild animals of the earth of every kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals of the earth of every kind and the cattle of every kind and everything that creeps upon the ground of every kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, see, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that is the breath of life, I've given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished in all their multitude. 
And on the seventh day, God finished the work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and hallowed it, because on it God rested from all the work that he had done in creation. Good morning. I, I think I've told you before that I am a big fan of the game of baseball. Almost 10 years ago, Bob and I spent our 25th wedding anniversary enjoying the National Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York for over eight hours. They had to come and find us and ask us to leave when they were ready to close because we lost track of time. Bob and I have already booked tickets to several Lancaster Stormers games this summer. They're not barnstormers anymore. We've moved into a new millennium. We even try to go see a game whenever we go on vacation. Last week, we saw the Myrtle Beach Pelicans play the Fayetteville Woodpeckers. It was a blast. The Pelicans won in a weird blowout created mostly by errors on the field. 
That's minor league baseball for you. And one fun fact, the Pelicans have a bat dog instead of a bat boy or bat girl. The dog goes out to the plate to bring the bat back to the dugout in its teeth. And then there's an actual bat boy standing there whose sole job is to wipe the dog spit off the bat. It is fabulous. Now, even though Bob and I are devoted Christians, we don't feel bad about dedicating some of our precious time to baseball because we know that God is a baseball fan, too. In fact, he started his entire Bible with the words, in the big inning. <laughs> I know that's an old joke, and you've probably all heard it before. But the game of baseball itself or whatever sport or hobby or even work activity you've come to enjoy, whether as a spectator or a participant. Every game, every project can remind us of the beginning and the growth we've gained in knowledge or skill. Now I imagine every one of you could tell me about the first game you ever played or the first time you went to the ballpark or the basketball court or the golf course or the fishing pier or your first day on the job. Maybe you could tell me about the first quilt you made, or who taught you to knit, or crochet, or make furniture, or do whatever you do with your hands. Even if you are now an expert in many ways in your sport or hobby, don't you still sometimes go back in your memory, just go back to basics to learn from the remembrance of the journey. Nobody ever gets good at something without giving it time and energy and by remembering and building on what they've already learned. And that includes Bible knowledge, which is fundamental to our relationship with God. Today we're starting a rather lengthy sermon series in which we take a look at the old and tie it to the new. Because some of us don't know much about the Bible or don't remember what we used to know. We're calling our series The Big Picture. Because even here on Sunday mornings, we tend to concentrate a lot of our thinking on the little picture, a couple of Bible verses here and there, and mostly from the New Testament, the story of Jesus, as though his story has nothing to do with the rest of the Bible. And if we're honest, I think a lot of us think the Old Testament isn't really relevant to our lives here in 2024. But it is important. So important, friends, for us to know the Bible as one continuous story from beginning to end. From the big inning through the book of Revelation and beyond into our very lives today. In his book, All Things New, Christian writer Hugh Welchel mentions a powerful scene at the end of J.R.R. Tolkien's book, The Lord of the Rings. And it's a scene that is not in the movie. After the ring is destroyed and the eagles rescue Sam and Frodo, Sam wakes up from sleep, surprised he is alive, and surprised to see the wizard Gandalf standing at the foot of his bed. Gandalf, he says, I thought you were dead, but then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? Welchel writes, for many the world today does not make sense. Even with the saving grace of Jesus Christ, the reality of sin makes it plain that things are not as they should be. Pain, suffering, and destruction plague the earth. As Christians, we struggle to find purpose in our work. We face conflict in relationships. We have trouble applying our faith to every area of our lives. We get struck in the rut of mundane life, unable to see how the stories of the Bible connect to our day-to-day -day lives. He's right, isn't he? Even at our most recent church board meeting, one of our brothers said, there is risk in dragging us all through the Old Testament. People sometimes complain that the church does not meet them in their daily challenges of life, while it is always talking about the old men of the Bible doing strange ancient things, completely foreign to life's contemporary challenges. That made all the rest of the board members want to come to church this morning. But brothers and sisters, I agree, people struggle to understand how the narrative of the Bible is relevant to them nowadays. But don't you see, that is exactly why we need to look at the big picture through our worship and sermon series that we're embarking on. Because we can't apply the Bible to our lives until we understand the answer to that age-old question that Sam posed in The Lord of the Rings. Is everything sad going to come untrue? Because that is what we really want to know, isn't it? When our loved ones die, 
when wars prevail all over the world, when children are abused or sick or hungry. We want to know, we want to be assured that God is going to someday make it all all right. And friends, that assurance can be found in the redeeming, historical, rescuing narrative of the Bible. The only way, the only way for us to truly believe that all of God's promises will come true is to know how he is working at that and how he has been working at that. So through these coming weeks, through this worship series that we're kicking off today, you'll see that every part of the Bible, every part of it applies to you and your life. The beginning is connected to the end. And of course, the beginning is the beautiful creation scripture that Bob read for us just now. Quoting Welchel again, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth is only the beginning of the creation story, not only the beginning of it, but also the beginning of the universal story that will ultimately embrace the whole of creation, time, and humanity within its scope. So you see, friends, we can only fully understand God when we understand when we truly believe that he has loved us from the very beginning and continues to love us, that from the very beginning, his story is one continuous storyline that results in the redemption of mankind and the restoration of our relationship with him. In Welchel's book, he says that the church has often looked at the Bible as though it has only two major ideas, the fall, Adam and Eve introduce sin to the world, and redemption, Jesus Christ, is raised from the dead. And while sin and salvation are certainly important to recognize and accept as reality, they do not represent the complete picture of God, his complete story for us. If we only see the Bible as those two parts, we leave out God's original, very good creation and God's promise to restore creation in its entirety in the future. That would be an incomplete story, and it's the kind of thing that leads us to believe that salvation is all about us as individuals. It turns the Bible into a book about sin management, leaving our relationship with God and with his people out of the narrative. Welchel says this leads Christians to see our salvation only as a bus ticket to heaven, to believe that what we do while waiting for the bus doesn't matter. Instead, when we look at the Bible as having four major parts, it begins with creation, and then the fall, and then redemption, but then restoration. We can better come to understand our identity as God's people, and then only then we can see our role in his story. And friends, every one of us has a role in God's story. There are no bit players. When we look at the big picture, we will begin to understand the context that gives meaning to all people, places, and things. And then we can address the questions that trouble our hearts. Why am I here? What is God's purpose for my life? Why is the world so broken? Now, as many of you know, I serve as an adjunct professor at Eastern Mennonite University teaching biblical perspectives. And one of the first things I teach my students is that every one of us sees the world through a unique view or perspective. We all bring every past experience and everything we've ever learned to every new situation. We can't help but do that. It's called worldview. As Christians, we have learned to see the world through the perspective of the Bible, and that's a good thing, but we must remember that we also bring our worldview to our study of that Bible. So maybe we can admit that our view is often rigid, that we stick with what we know instead of allowing ourselves to grow with it throughout our entire lives. Welchel says it's like a set of prescription glasses when we live with a blurry prescription for a long time, life out of focus becomes routine. It seems normal, and we don't even realize what we might be missing, that we could be seeing something more. But when you get a new pair of glasses, everything becomes clear, and we're surprised by what we didn't see before. 
In the same way, understanding the Bible as one comprehensive story enables us to grasp, to understand our own identity as God's people. And from this perspective, then, we recognize our call to participate in God's rescue plan as part of his story, not just in the future, but right here and right now, every day. And that brings us to today's part of God's story, creation. God's creation. So by coming to see that we are literally part of God's grand story, we can begin to understand the call that God has for us to care for all that he has given us. Not just in the physical world of plants and animals, earth and water, what we call creation, but also in every relationship, in every aspect of our lives. The creation accounts of other cultures involved a war between the gods, sexual generation of the universe, but in contrast, Genesis tells us God alone created a good creation out of love. So we can understand how we can live out our response to God's calling in light of our love for him because he loved us first. God calls us to himself as creator, of course he does, but he also calls us to family to community, to vocation, to church. And yes, he rested on the seventh day, but he did not stop creating for good that day. He's still creating. God's story begins with his love for us, and then it continues throughout the entire 66 books of the Bible by reminding us over and over and over again that God loves us and he wants to bring us back into the perfect relationship with him that he has always meant for us to have. Loving God equips us for his specific calling for each of our lives. We are specifically designed to know God and to love him. In response to that love, we love others and the world in which we live. Understanding the way things were, creation, the way things are, fallen and broken, the way things could be through redemption, and the way things will be through God's restoration gives us not only perspective, but it also gives us incentive to fulfill God's purposes. It makes us want to carefully manage all of our resources and all of our talents and gifts for the glory of God instead of for ourselves. We often hear people talking about saving creation for the next generation. That's a good thing, but we're supposed to be doing it to bring glory to God, not to us or even the next generation. Hockey great Sidney Crosby once said, I promise to play for the logo on the front of this jersey, not the name on the back. We are called by God to play for the team, for his people, his creation, not just for ourselves. This calling should teach, touch every aspect of our lives and all of our relationships. It should show in the way we walk and talk and think and act every day in every way. N.T. Wright, a former senior bishop in the Church of England and scripture scholar, uses the metaphor of a play to explain the importance of understanding our role within God's larger story. Imagine that you've discovered a lost manuscript of a Shakespeare play, and you quickly realize it is the greatest play Shakespeare ever wrote. Soon you realize that Act 3, Scene 3 is missing. It's been destroyed or lost over the years. In order for the play to make any sense, in order to perform it, you must rewrite Scene 3. But you can't just make up a scene that is inconsistent with Shakespeare's style and with what has happened in the first two acts of the play and what you have from the fourth act. Instead, you must study the larger story and you must study the playwright to understand Shakespeare's intention. While the other acts are important, without act three, scene three, the play does not make sense. Brothers and sisters, We are living in Act 3, Scene 3. To live out this scene in God's grand story, we must understand who God is and what he intended for his characters. And we must live out that understanding in every dimension of life. 
We are waiting for the full resolution of the story while we live out Act 3 of the play, the part about redemption. This is the greatest story ever told, and we each play a critical character in the story. Again, there are no extras in this play. We must know the first two and two-thirds acts of the play, though, to do justice to God's story. We must study the whole story of God if we expect to be part of Act 4, in which everything God has planned for us will be restored. Reading the Bible as one comprehensive story enables us to understand our role in God's story. Again, he calls us to himself, but he also calls us to his people, to our families and our communities, and to our role in his kingdom and in his church. The Bible narrative explains not only why we are called to these areas, but it also outlines how we can live out our response to God in light of our love for him. Who loved us first? It is the ultimate story of significance for all of humanity. Next week we'll hear about how we broke our relationship with God. And then in subsequent weeks, we'll see over and over and over again how God has worked at, is still working to get us back into that perfect, loving relationship he intended for each and every one of us to have with him. Now let's go back to that sport or hobby or job that you enjoy. The one for which you can still remember the journey. You can still go back to the basics to learn from them. So even if you now are an expert in many ways in your sport or your hobby or your job, you know as well as I do, nobody ever gets good at something without giving it some time and energy and by remembering what they have learned and building on that. And you know where I'm going with this. We need to be dedicated to that kind of time and energy and dedication to the Bible. To remembering where we came from and how we got here. So we can see more clearly where we're going and exactly how God wants us to get there. The Bible, all of the Bible, is relevant to us today. You'll see. So brothers and sisters, right here, Right now, I'm asking, challenging all of us to be here every Sunday throughout this series. And if you have to miss one, to pick it up on YouTube. Because the continuous story of God is the story of your life, your call from God, your spirit, your eternity. And you can't do what God is calling you to do if you are living Act 3, Scene 3, but you don't know or barely remember the first two acts of the play. Can you? And then once we all know God's story a little better together, it will change our church. And maybe it will even change your life. Maybe it'll change you. Are we up for this challenge together? I think we are. I will be praying, and I will pray that you will pray too. Because God's promise for us is that the beginning is connected to the end, and that everything sad is going to come untrue. Amen.
And will you pray with me? Creator God, may your spirit open our eyes anew to the vastness and splendor of your creation all around us. What you meant it to be and what it can be and will be again. Above all, let us see your beauty, even in the brokenness of our brothers and sisters and of our world. We know all mankind, womankind, humankind is created in your image, all waiting to experience the redemption that comes only through Jesus our Lord. Help us to desire to grow into the creations you meant for us to be and into our relationship with you, that we may be not only redeemed, but also restored. Amen. <laughs>